Welcome to episode 26 of the Camera Shake podcast, the podcast where we talk about everything and anything and just about anything to do with photography, uh, video, how to make photos, uh, how to make videos and everything that's got anything to do with that. But today's a special episode, not only, not only because it's episode 26, but it's uh, also I'm really thrilled to have um, a really awesome guest on the show today. It's no other than Tommy Reynolds. Uh, Tommy, I'm so glad you've uh, you've agreed to come on the show. It's uh, phenomenal. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Awesome. Now, for those of you who, uh, and I'm sure most of our tens of listeners are probably familiar with your work, um, but for those of you who are not, Tommy is a really awesome portrait uh, and travel photographer, um, YouTuber, music video director, educator, and public speaker. Did that cover just sure. about everything? <laughs> I I do have fingers in quite a number of different pies, don't I? <laughs> yeah, right. When you list it out like this, you're going to go, oh, when, yeah. Okay. When you list it out like that, like, <laughs> you're making me sound so much better than... I, you, you can write my bio next time. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll talk about that after the show. Yeah. Right, cool. So, Tommy, um, so you're a full-time freelance photographer. I am. But you're also a YouTuber. I'm also and, a YouTuber. Yeah. yeah, and so out of interest, I mean, really, you know, how do you find the time to combine both of these, both of these things? Because I'm, I'm guessing um, it must take quite, quite a lot of time. I'm saying this because I've obviously I've seen your videos, and I, you know, you put so much, um, so much effort and so much production value into those. Yeah. That I can imagine that it would take you quite a long time to to get these to get these together. How do you combine like, you know, being a full-time photographer and keeping a video, uh, a YouTube channel up like that? No, that's a, that's, um, that's a really good question. No one's actually ever asked me that, that question before. And, and that's, it's, it's a really interesting one because I, I think it's just because I have such a huge passion for not only photography, but also video as well. So is it, is Nick, is it you that's the videographer of the pair? Correct. Yeah. So, so Nick, I'll kind of like channel some of this, some of this answer towards you then, because I, um, way back in the day, I actually, uh, went to university and studied filmmaking. I don't, I don't actually have any qualifications in photography. I did, I, I did it very briefly at, at school though, but when it was the option to do it at sixth form or university, it was coming at, coming at it from a very artistic point of view and not what I wa really wanted to learn. And, um, you know, I, I finished doing it at school and I still didn't even know what apertures were. And so it was taught from a very artistic point of view. And I wanted to learn the technicality of it. And at the time I was kind of into filming as well. And there's kind of a natural kind of transition from photography and filming because you're using a, a somewhat the same equipment. So I actually ended up deciding to do filmmaking university and thoroughly enjoyed that. And I feel like fast forward um, five years, six years, I'm only now kind of using my degree, but not to kind of use it to film other clients, but also to benefit my own business, if you like, mm -hmm. by using the skills that I learned to promote my own business by doing the form of behind the scenes. So that's why I've got such a huge passion for filmmaking. I, because I can then, I can just channel it within my photography and I get just as almost excited as sharing my behind the scenes video, just as much as the images themselves. I, I, cause I have such a love for both, both, both fields and there's a nice natural progression, but in terms of finding the time, I, I guess I, well, I'm, I'm almost killing two birds if you like, because I'm now in a position where sometimes I will sell to clients the idea of having a behind the scenes video. So not only am I providing them images, but I'm also providing them a behind the scenes video, which I'm also quite often more, more often than not able to use that on my own YouTube channel to promote my own business, promoting my own thing as well. So most of the time I can combine it and you can make it work towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, work. just, yeah, just end, ended up making it work. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Do you find that your clients are quite receptive to um, having the idea of a behind the scenes um, video going on at the same time as, you know, a portrait shoot, for example? Ah, hundred percent. I think it's, uh, it's a bit of an easy sell. Uh, if mm. the budget is there, then, then, then most definitely, I think it doesn't take a very, it doesn't take long at all to convince them how, how, just all the benefits of it. You know, you, you can talk to them about algorithms. You can say that it will do better online than photos. It's more content to share, yeah. but in a, in a kind of a underlying motive way, it's also then it gives me the, uh, 
the excuse to create a behind the scenes video, not just for them, but also it's more content for me to use to show off. This is what I did this week. So mm. in the past, it was always off of my own accord and we can, you know, we can talk about, you know, how I started it, but now it's at a position where it's a fairly easy sell because who, who wouldn't want a behind the scenes video? Who mm. wouldn't want extra content promoting that same product? So, mm. but that's generally my, my go-to deliverables now would be a series of images and a behind the scenes video and now some of my clients won't work what won't do the do the work with me unless i'm able to provide that behind the scenes video because now they're recognizing how awesome it is to have that provided with the with the images as deliverable so yeah it's uh, it's a fairly easy sell at this point now which is cool it makes a lot of sense doesn't it i mean if you think about the way society has <laughs> been for the longest time now that they love candid they love yeah, you know, for want of a better word, the voyeuristic style, you know, the, the, those kind of things, ever, probably ever since Big Brother started, I would say. Yeah. You know, ever since that moment, yeah. everybody loves that type of stuff. Well, there's that, but it's also, you know, there's, there's such, a, an, such an amazing educational, like, teaching opportunity right there oh, because God, it's... Yeah. Because that's kind of that, you know, in a creative industry, I think you very often you find that people learn that way the best, you yeah. know, by seeing mm-hmm. somebody do something and by watching somebody, um, you know, getting putting a shoot together or executing a shoot or, you know, you watch them use certain techniques or certain modifiers or certain gear. Um, and uh, it's just it's such a nice. great learning. So I think what, what you're really what you're achieving there is you're really killing a number of birds with the same exactly. with the same lens. You know, I like that. I like that. By, um, <laughs> you can have that one. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's just interesting content and everything. But it's you know, it's it's a really great opportunity to to educate, you know, and to teach um, and show people how to do things. Yeah. That's you know, that's but certainly was... how I first came across your channel is by by watching these behind the scenes videos because I wanted to learn about certain certain very specifically, actually very specifically, <laughs> your your video that dealt with um, hand painted uh, backdrops. <laughs> you know. Because that was at the time, that was in my head. That's what I wanted to do, um, and I needed to get some info on that. And I came across your channel originally that way. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate. It. But 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 interestingly, when I kind of got into YouTube, it was never with the intention of growing my my channel to be you know anything remotely famous or you know as other people might have might start with that intention. Mm-hmm. It literally was. I just wanted to archive and have evidence of you know this is what we did during the shoot because i had such a passion for filmmaking i um i did a i was i was setting up one of my first ever personal projects and just reached out to my friend who's a filmmaker and said um it'd actually be quite nice if we can get her little behind the scenes video it might it might just be nice just to have just to provide with it that was literally the extent of it i had no ulterior motive no financial motive no marketing motive it was just a it would just be a nice thing to have on my YouTube channel to look back on because I only had like a hundred followers at the time. It was never with with that intention, but the light bulb moment was when I shared that video. I'd shared the photos a few days prior, but it was when I shared the video that was that accompanied it. The amount of engagement I got on that video was tremendous. Mm. So people were saying it was so nice to see what lens you use. It was so nice to see how you interacted with the model, how you interacted with your team. It looked like you had fun. It looked, mm. I liked how you were involved, even choosing the the um, the attire, what the what the models wore. You can't show any of that in a final image, and that's mm-hmm. what's so yeah. beautiful about mm-hmm. behind the scenes videos. You can show so much more and give the audience so much context and yeah. show how you work as a person. And I think that's how I've been able to get the, the work I have in a weird way. People are more interested in how I shoot something, not what I shoot. Yeah. Because as, uh, as you said, before we, before we, before we went live, it's um, people are just naturally interested in, in that creative process and want to, yeah. uh, they're curious and they're, it's, um, it's like, as, as you said, with, with Big Brother, it's like, why reality TV is around why vloggers do so well. It's just the natural curiosity to see how someone does something, you know, there, there are millions and millions of uh, softbox tutorials out there and it almost could discourage someone. Well, why should I make a tutorial? You know, when there's thousands, because no one will say it the way you can, no one will right. explain it the way you can. And that is what makes you unique. You know, when I, when I think of 
when I think of my favourite teacher at school, I don't think of the subject, I think of the way he taught it, because there are, uh, media studies was my favourite subject, and it was the way he taught it that stood out for me. And I think that's what can make you, that's what can make you stand out, especially nowadays, is that it's not, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. That's and I think that's... 100%. Oh, sorry, sorry. You know, it's a funny thing I, I often do so in my own mind is um, when I look at different YouTubers, for example, um, I sort of attach a word to them, you know, and you'd have like, you'd have like Peter McKinnon, it'd be cool. Then you'd have somebody like uh, Sean Tucker, for example, you know, thoughtful, yes. you know, and then I see you and it's like passion, <laughs> <laughs> you know, full on passion. I will and, take that. That's I brilliant. I think he's I got the winning word there. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. But, but that's the thing. And that's, you know, there's something there's a spark that needs to come across, you know, when, because there are lots of channels that are, you know, that, that you watch and you kind of go, oh, yeah, okay, not for me. I don't, you know, there's always, you know, the ones that you get hooked on are really, there's got to be something that kind of flies across and, and there's something that needs to resonate with you. And, and, you know, with your, with your channel and the way you present things, it's really the, the passion that really comes across. And as somebody who's, who's also very extre extremely passionate about photography and, you know, filmmaking and the creative process and, and the behind the scenes thing, it totally, absolutely, 100% just immediately resonated. I'm like, okay, cool. I need to watch, more, you know, more mm -hmm. of this. So oh, no, I really appreciate that. That's, I'm genuinely humbled to hear you say that because I, I, sometimes I ask people, what is it about my YouTube that you like? And I know I shouldn't really be asking that because sometimes I get myself caught in a rut where, you know, I, I feel like, should I be making that type of content? Because I know it does well. And obviously that is totally the wrong reason, but it's so nice to hear you say that, you know, if you could give it, give it a word, it would be passion. And it almost just kind of reasserts in my own head that I am doing the right thing. And I'm, that that yeah i i'm i should carry on as, as i am yeah that's cool. <laughs> okay. I, I you're welcome man. <laughs> i appreciate that Working. i really do now in in your videos like over the last sort of six you know seven months um you've covered a lot of creative aspects you know, like uh, some of the, the, the social distancing um, photo shoot, for example yes. you know was one um you know i watched that and i thought you know again i thought like that's such a good idea you know, <laughs> that's such a great idea like you know um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a video about creative self portraits, um, yeah. that you made as well. And I found that really interesting. Um, and of course there was a, there's a video about finding your own style. And I'm a, I'm a really, I'm a really a big believer of, of finding your own style. You know, my background is uh, in music for a lot, for a large part, I spent um, 25 years, you know, being a session musician and teaching music and everything. And, um, I've always thought that finding your own style in music and actually in any creative field is, is, is kind of what your end goal should be rather than mm -hmm. just being a copy machine, you know, mm -hmm. and copying everybody else. Yeah. And so, um, how difficult has it been to create, um, YouTube content over the whole lockdown? Like since, you know, since the beginning of, when did it, when is March. it like, like March or something like that? How, how difficult has it been to, um, to create content because, uh, content because I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's been much harder to, to collaborate with other people in that time. No, a hundred percent, especially if you will label yourself as a portrait photographer mm. uh, when you can't interact with other people. And it was because of that, that I thought, well, how can I, you mentioned the social distancing photo shoot video for those of you that, um, are not aware. So I did a video on my YouTube channel where I wanted to find out how could I still photograph people? in my studio without them being present and it was actually the, the the what gave me the inspiration for that was everyone at the time was doing um oh, i forgot forgot the the term that people were using it but they were basically using their iphone like facetime photo shoots i don't know if, oh, you, yeah, that's right. if you remember that yeah, so yeah. it was that that kind of inspired me how can i do that but much better because obviously mm. you know facetime print screen it's not going to be that great quality and it was actually um with the with Zoom, you know, come, come March, no one really knew much about Zoom. Now the whole world knows about Zoom. Yeah. And it was my my friend who's a uh, teacher, she took her stuff online as many teachers did. And she showed me a feature that I didn't even know existed on Zoom. So on Zoom, you can not only share your screen, but you can also give the person the opportunity to use your cursor. And right there was a light bulb moment. And mm. I, was, I was talking to my friend Stephen and uh, we both come up with the idea of, 
we could then not only share my screen, we could then give people the cursor as, cause I knew that, you know, there are apps out there where you can connect your camera to your computer or your machine where you can remote shutter. And I thought, well then if they've got the ability to move the cursor, they've got the ability to then take the picture and then potentially frame up anything they want. So that's where the kind of inspiration came from that. And I wouldn't have thought of that idea if it wasn't for COVID in a really weird way. You know, I've, yeah. I've spoke about this a few times over the lockdown and weirdly enough, COVID's almost encouraged me to be more creative, which is why I think in the last seven months, I've been the most creative I think I've ever been. Um, because mm. I think re- giving yourself restrictions makes you um, more creative. Like yeah. if you have an endless supply of, of modifiers, but if you only have one, then it obviously forces you to be as creative as you can with just that one modifier. Yeah. So this was my own kind of restriction in, in my own way. And this was a way that I could try and just feel creatively fulfilled. And that's my ultimate goal. And I, I believe it should be everyone's goal is to feel creatively fulfilled, feel tired at the end of the day in a good way and know that you've done something that's, that's a bit different and it's really cool. So always better to be different rather than better, which yeah. I think is uh, what, um, who said that from Chase Jarvis? He always says, be different. No, was it be, is it be different, not perfect or be different, not I forget exactly, but you know what, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I, I like the, um, the limitation bit because I, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I felt, um, the same, I kind of felt the same thing. Um, I sort of felt that my photography had kind of come to a point where it was just, it felt like, you know, walking in the same spot all the time. Yeah. You know, because when, when you end up doing a lot of commercial work, um, very quickly, especially like headshots, you know, as much as I love headshots and portraiture and the whole thing, you know, corporate headshots, there's really only so far you can go with that mm-hmm. <laughs> in a way, you know, until it becomes really quite repetitive. Of course. And, um, and, uh, I thought that if I just limit everything down to the, like down to the bone, like I'm not going to have, uh, interchangeable lenses. I'm just going to go for a camera that just gives me one focal length and one focal length only. So I went and uh, got a Fuji X100F at the time. Oh, you know? nice. And that will basically limit me to 35 mil and that is it. And I've never been happier. And I remember all my friends saying like, what, you're crazy. What, you're stupid. Why would you do that? You've got like a whole shelf full of lenses. Like that's, you know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and I kind of went, no, I'm going to do this. And I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to find a new creative way because I've, I've just come to like, you know, I've hit the wall you know, to, to use like a runner's term. And, yeah. um, and it's really opened up so many, so many new avenues for me at the time. It's just limiting myself to, to something. Did you find when you, when you bought that and you started using that more regularly, that that creativity then transferred to not using that particular camera and going back to your regular 750 and so on? Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, a, it's just a way of thinking. I think, um, it breaks you out of that, out of that rut, yeah, you know, and it's more like adopting that um, that way of thinking than than, than the actual tool. Totally. You know, it's, it's just a, so, and I, and I use that a lot. I mean, I, you know, lockdown again. You know, we wouldn't be sitting here if it hadn't been for uh, mm. for lockdown uh, because we we started this this podcast um, as a consequence of lockdown. You know, yeah, that was yeah. because literally we. I remember we we worked on the last project we worked on was an automotive like a car shoot. Uh, that we did in March. And I remember editing this and hearing the news um, of lockdown and thinking like, shoot, like, what are we going to do now? (laughs) (laughs) No, damn it. And then, uh, you know, it was literally just the next thought, like, was, uh, okay, well, we can't, we can't shoot together. So, um, you know, like, do you remember this, this thing? The podcast idea we had like six months ago and we never actually, you know, we kicked it, we kept kicking the can down the road. (laughs) Yeah, and yeah. You never got started because life was always too busy, um, and then that was the perfect opportunity. And uh, here we are, like twenty six episodes later, you know, uh, still doing it and talking to really interesting people on the show and learning lots. You know, we've God. learned tons of stuff just by talking to other people. And, and everyone's got a different story, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 about looking for opportunity. I think in you know in something that quite easily could kind of drag you down the depths of depression <laughs> if you're not careful. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's, um, well, it's, it's, as, as you, as you guys have said, it's, 
you know this it's, it's created an opportunity for us to to be creative it's it's given us an opportunity to reset it's given us an mm. opportunity to step back and um and just think a little a little bit differently and you guys wouldn't have done this podcast we wouldn't be having this conversation now mm. we wouldn't be talk, talking about some of the things i've already spoken about with my creativity i feel like i'm in such a better headspace weirdly enough because of covid because it gave me the excuse to to rethink, recharge, and reevaluate what's really important to me, and um, and I wouldn't have done that video for the virtual show talking about finding your own style. I w- I didn't find my style until until lockdown when I realised that it what well, it's not about style, it's about story. And you said it, Alex. Everyone's got a different story, right? Mm. And that's what makes you unique, and that's how you can incorporate that into your behind the scenes. That's how I like to do it. For me, mm. that creative process the best creative process is sharing behind the scenes. Now you, you know, you don't have to share behind the scenes videos if you're not comfortable with it. I know that back in the day I didn't speak to camera until quite late on, but now I kind of maybe do an overview, do talk overs or do tutorials just to give it added context. But everyone has a different story and it's, and that's what makes you unique. And that that's, if you can get that across then, and you can speak from the heart, then you're bulletproof. Cause I've done some projects where, I thought, I don't care what anyone says online on this video. I really don't. I care when, when I make a tutorial, but that's almost because it's a bit, for lack of a better word, I, I do tutorials to grow my channel. So I do one video for them, one video for me. Okay. So it'd be a personal project doing like social distancing photo shoot. I know that that won't do well online because it's not like five ways to use one softbox. Mm. That will do better because there's so many more keywords in there. But I can't do i can't have a youtube channel full of tutorials because it's not as creatively fulfilling yeah. as the personal work that i like to throw in the mix it's like when a uh, youtube musicians how they will purposely do covers just to get new new audiences in and once they're in hopefully they see some of their original work because if they have a youtube channel just full of original work it m- might not get might not get seen as much as if they were to throw in the odd cover so Mm. you do it with intention and i mean don't get me wrong i it's fun to make tutorials but it's not as fun as doing the personal work or like you said kirsten with the um headshots there's only so much you can do with headshots before it kind of gets boring and it was because of headshots that i nearly quit photography way back in the day when i started Mm. you know a couple of years in i was only doing headshots because your mindset changes when you go from doing this thing that you love as an amateur and then you now get paid to do it. And it's, it is a different mindset when you become a professional and you now need to rely on this. It's not something you can pick up when you want to, you have to pick up that camera sometimes, some days if you, if you don't want to, and you have to be creative if you don't want to, because it's now your business. You now have to use it to put money on the table. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I kind of, that's how I kind of got into doing personal work because I was burning out doing headshots because I thought this isn't creative anymore. Mm -hmm. I need to go back to that feeling when I was an amateur, when I didn't care about making mistakes, when I didn't care about being afraid to fall. And I think that's a lot of, I think that's a lot of people's worries nowadays is being afraid to fail and showing that online. And I am a firm believer that vulnerability is not a weakness. It's a strength. And this is a conversation that me and Sean Tucker had um, on his YouTube about vulnerability and how important that is. Mm. Well, that's, um, that's it. It's, I think um, when, when you get to the point where um, your, you know, your passion becomes your job and then all of a sudden you have the, the sort of the external pressures of having, you know, having to bring home the bacon and like in my, yeah. in my case here, I've got kids. So, you know, I've got to yeah, buy birthday yeah, yeah. presents. <laughs> so it's like, uh, you know, um, so today is that pressure there, um, but I, I like the thing you you talked about on your YouTube channel about um, about coming up with a personal project per month. Yes, and that really, you know, that at one point that really resonated with me. Well, it still resonates with me now, but um, it's I think when, when I felt that I was kind of, you know, um, that I was starting to get stuck in a bit of a rut, I kind that really was the thing where I thought, yeah, man, that's exactly what I should do. Is I should just do a personal project. I should come up with some, I don't know, you know, weird idea, and then just execute. And um, and I like the whole thing where I look back at something and I take stock and I basically go, okay, this went well. This totally sucked. I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but 
but you you develop and, and I tell you one thing that's happened is not only has that rekindled um the the love for not only for photography but also for the creative process because I've always been one of these people who for me the creative process has always been the important part whether that was in music writing a tune you know recording it in a studio working with other musicians um, and then I wasn't really that interested in the end product because once the end product was there, the track, or in this case, the photo or even the video, I'm already moving on to the next thing. It's like, I'm yeah. already thinking about the next process because that's yeah. the fun part for me. It's actually, is is getting, is the getting there. Once you're there, it's time to look for a new destination. But yeah, it's not the destination, it's the journey, right? It's a journey, mm-hmm. right? Exactly right. Yeah. So, um, so I liked your, your, um, your video about, about you know, finding a, a creative project, a personal project um, a month, and then just going and doing that. And then the the effect that that will have on your creativity is just immeasurable. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, as I say, I, um, I came up with that idea because I was stuck in that rut of shooting mm-hmm. headshots. And that's when I decided to for it for the first time in two years, go back to when I was an amateur and do a shoot for me and no one else not have to worry about what a client's going to think, you know, cause this is my shoot, my idea, my concept. And I, um, I, the, the opportunities I've had because of my personal work have just been fantastic. Like mm. the, I did a, um, one of the things I'm most proud of is I did some work with Olympus. So I went to Ethiopia to shoot some portraits. I would not have been able to do that if it wasn't for personal work, because I proved mm. my worth first by going to, previously Vietnam, Sri Lanka, India, they were all personal project trips that I took it upon myself and I paid for myself to go and shoot these portraits. You know, Nike isn't going to call me up to shoot their trainers unless I shoot hundreds and hundreds of images of trainers and put it out there. And I'm not expecting them to, but Olympus took that opportunity to work, want, uh, worked with me because I proved my worth first. So sometimes use, you can use, use your personal projects um, as a means of getting into that thing you want to do, proving your worth first, because with this industry, it's nothing to do with CV. It's all portfolio. You know, I haven't touched my CV in ten years. It's not, no one cares about that you have a, you have a degree in in that thing. I, that might be a controversial thing saying that, but you know, even though I have a degree, I can say this because I actually have a degree in filmmaking. But that's certainly done. That's not got me a job. That's not walked up to someone and said. Um, can I work with you? It's me that's done that. So yeah. you don't, I think for this industry, you don't necessarily need a degree. You've just got to drive passion and, and ambition. And, uh, yeah. and I think it's because of my YouTube channel has been the reason that I've been able to get some work. And I genuinely didn't think that that was ever going to be the case, but I'd like to think, I like to think that it's become my USP. Now it's the way I share my things. It's, I'm not, I'm not the best photographer. I'm never going to be the best photographer, but I, what's you, what's unique is the way I share things. And it's the way you share things. As you said, again, Alex, everyone has their own story. So if, if it's your own story and you're passionate about it, then again, no, no amount of bad comments are going to touch you. You're bulletproof because it's personal, you know, as long as you're proud of it, then you shouldn't matter what other people think. When when you first uh, started getting into YouTube, did you like? How did you feel about like negative comments or like you know when somebody gave you a thumbs down or something like that on a video? Did that affect you more than it does affect you now? Uh, it, not at the not at the start. I mean, i i didn't get a I didn't get a thumbs I didn't get a thumbs down because the only people that were watching were my mum and my dad. And, and <laughs> that's where we are now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Brilliant. laughs> like, when I got a thumbs down, I was like. I made it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, it's, um, it's, it, I, I think I'm, I'm now, I'm much more thick skinned now than I certainly was back then. It's, mm. and I think it's just human nature. Like you could get a hundred lovely comments and you get one bad comment and that sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. And it's, it's just, I think it's just a muscle that you just almost train in yourself, just like going to the gym. Mm. I think it's a muscle you just have to train to kind of just ignore. If it's constructive, absolutely. But most of the time, it's not constructive. And funny mm. enough, anyone who leaves me a really crappy comment, I I can't help myself, but I go on their profile and 99% <laughs> of the time they'll have no videos uploaded, no profile picture, yeah. and it'll be a really random name. So you like, like X 
X O three zero one one one. Like it's just a really random thing. And I just think, yeah, just, just saying something for the sake of it. It's just, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't touch me at all. So, yeah. uh, and as I keep saying, if it's a personal project, I don't, I don't care. Do you know, I actually keep in my wallet. I don't have it here with me. Not that you can see if you're listening to this online, but it's again, something Brene Brown does who said that quote I said earlier about vulnerability is not a weakness. It's a strength. And something that she does that I do in my wallet, I have a tiny little piece of paper of five names and those five names are people that I love the most. And they're my mum, my sister, my partner, my close friends. They're the people that I show new work to and I, I make it for the people I love. And if they like it, then I don't care what other people think because they don't really interact with my life. And mm. I, you've got to make work for you and uh, pret- pretend you're making work for your family. Like you're producing work that your family or your loved ones are going to, are going to appreciate and love. And they're going to see that passion. They, they will see it, yeah. you know? Um, so I, I make it for them and, and for me and not for anyone else. If you don't like it, then you don't have to follow me. You don't, mm. I, I, it kind of reminds me of the Ricky Gervais thing. I don't know if you guys are aware, aware of this joke, but um, I think it's so true. Like how he gets called out a lot on Twitter about like, oh, I, um, like if he if they get offended by what he said, it's like you've chosen to follow me though. Like <laughs> yeah, easy, exactly, you can just easily not follow me. And he said it's it's the equivalent of walking around and seeing a billboard for guitar lessons and then calling that number up and go but I don't want guitar lessons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You, you don't have to follow. And so, yeah, yeah it was a weird analogy, but it made yeah. sense in my head at the time. It's almost like, you know, when people, people complain about a particular TV show or something, it's like, but you don't have to watch it. You just turn it off. I mean, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's that easy. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. It's, uh, I, 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 I don't get many negative, make many negative comments on my personal, personal work, but I, I might often get, negative comments on my tutorials because it might have ugh, just the slightest little thing that a, 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 a pixel people will have noticed and I just mm. think come on dude come on uh-huh. like yeah come on and but you just you know the, the internet's full of those for those types of people you just gotta just gotta move on get that thick skin and just just move on I didn't uh, you know it's I made it for the people around me, not not for. I don't care about what anyone else thinks, which I know is a weird weird thing to say, but it's. I, just... I don't think it is. I think that's absolutely the right attitude to have towards it as well, and that comes across in your in your in your work, right? That you do you are doing this for yourself. You are sharing what you're sharing just to so other people may enjoy it, and hopefully they'll also learn something from what you're doing as well. And that comes across. It's not like you're ramming. <laughs> uh business you know drumming business up from it that's because that's not the case at all and you can see through that when you see videos immediately you know as soon as within the first 10 seconds whether they're going to ram a product down your throat or mm. they're only putting this video out there just to get business and that's the only reason they're doing it and you spot it straight away see there's, there's yeah. a thing <clears throat> you know there's, there's a thing that i um there's certain youtube channels i've been following for a long time like uh, peter mckinnon i'm not you know um but I've been following Peter McKinnon's channel for for quite a long time, right from the very beginning, more or less. And and although I absolutely adore his style and his filmmaking, and um, it's it's very clever, you know. But more recently, I've sort of you know I've been I've been watching some videos, and it's like this is like a a twelve minute watch commercial. Mm. There's quite a few of those. Do lately. you know what I mean? It's like, mm. and I'm kind of thinking, and that's that's almost more off-putting than anything else yeah. um, because there's something that's crept in there that's just not quite as authentic as I thought it was. Do you know what I mean? Good word. Authentic. Um, and, um, and that immediately sort of instills cloud. And kind of, you know, that's, I always find that that's kind of where I think I, I tend to move on to other to mm. other channels for some, for some weird reason. Yeah. You know, yeah. although I mean, I still, you know, I still, I still like his channel. I'm not, you know, this isn't like, um, I'm not. What's the word? I'm not cussing the McKinnon. <laughs> <laughs> I you said so wrong saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do you know, old say that. Again. What, am I? <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe. oh well. I don't even know. My daughter keeps telling me this all the time. Oh, I'm like, well, you know, you're too old. I'm like, oh yeah, for sure. Like I can't, I can't follow that that lingo anymore lingo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ah. I mean, come on. I, 
it's, uh... you, you, I think there is a very, um, it's a hard balance when you're approached to make a video for the sole purpose of selling a product. And it's like, you, you want to find that balance between, you know, sh delivering what the typical video you would, but at the same time, it's almost a form of flattery when a brand will approach me and say, we'll pay sure. you this much to, to make a video. And, you know, I, I'm sure lo every, loads of people say this, but I genuinely mean it. I only work with brands that I genuinely love and admire. And I've said no to plenty of brands, like brands that I've never even used, like uh, working with Nikon. Like I've, 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 I've never worked with Nikon. I've never done anything with Nikon. Or so with, with Olympus I had and um, other, even little products. Like um, I've just done, I'm just about to release a video working with uh, Restream, which is a service that allows you to multi-stream to multiple platforms oh, yeah. at the same time. Mm. And at the moment, that's been one of my passions over lockdown is delving really into the depths of live streaming and how mm. you can produce the, the best quality and the best production. Um, and also Musicbed as well, the music uh, Musicbed I, I use on uh, my YouTube videos. I've been using Musicbed for years and years and years, and then they they approach me. I said, like, absolutely, I will work with you because mm. I've used your work for years. Epidemic Sounds approached me, and I said, no, because I've never I've not worked, I've never used your products, and it would be wrong of me to. Um, there have been, like, do you know? Actually, funny enough, on this topic, so I did a live stream with and uh, Restream sponsored it, and all they wanted me to do was speak about it at the very beginning and at the very end, mm. and someone said dude, this is seven minutes of you, uh, of you speaking about Restream. And I went back and it was 45 seconds of me speaking about it yeah. versus a 20, it was an, it was an hour live stream. Mm. And I spoke for 20 to 40, 40 seconds. And he yeah. said, like, it's, you, could, you can't win them all. But at the same time, especially during lockdown, <laughs> if, if, uh, if a brand's going to approach sure. me and say, we're going to pay you this much, I'm not, I'm not going to say no. Because I, and I responded to that comment and I mm. felt like I responded in a, in, in a nice way and said, this, the, what they're paying me is going to allow me to produce the type of content that I exactly. usually make. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing lots of live streams at the moment and maybe he just doesn't like seeing live streams. But again, it's mm. just, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of ranting right uh, in that respect. But mm. yeah, there is, it is hard to, to find a balance and it's just, you just got to stay true to yourself. Only work with the brands you really want to work with and um, use, show, show the video to those five people in your purse or your wallet and yeah. ask, ask for their true and true real opinion. And I'm, I'm not doing it for every single video. I'll do it for the odd, for the odd video because most of my income comes from weddings actually, which is something we, you know, I, I don't, call myself as a wedding photographer on YouTube it's just because I enjoy doing the portrait side but mm. two-thirds of my income if I'm being honest actually comes from wedding photography it's it's not with the portrait side of things as well actually if I if I may on a very quick tangent um I've got so I've got three websites now I started with a main portrait one Tommy Reynolds the credit UK then I ventured to doing wedding photography and now I have a third website, which is a training website specifically for photographers who want to do online coaching or uh, workshops or one-to-ones. And the reason why I'm speaking about this is that, iron ironically, the, the weddings and the co coaching is what makes me the most money. What I started out with, the portrait side, and what you see only on my YouTube is actually making me the least amount of mm. money. But it's my passion. Mm. And that should never go away just because it's a, it's a passion. Um, and that you're oh well you're making more money on this so you should concentrate more on that it's it's all about finding that balance and I guess the uh, the caveat to this rant is uh it is good to try different things it is good to have your fingers in different pies especially when you're going through a global pandemic because sometimes you might need to pick up that pie and try and get an income on that because this thing over here is clearly not making you income right now maybe but see if you can pick up this thing over this pie over here and see if it's going to you know, sh shake the tree and see if that <laughs> that makes you money yeah. at the moment. So that's why I I do jump between all three. All three make me money, but if I'm being honest, it's the last two websites that I started up that are making me more money now in a in a really weird way, which I didn't foresee happening. But you don't know until you try, right? Yeah. <clears throat> now we're talking about making money. So I know. Well, we have one thing uh, in common. I'm pretty sure we've got multiple things in common, but we've got one very specific thing in common, um, and that's I know that you started out. Uh, as a band photographer, 
Yes, I did. Photograph yeah. music. So that's exactly how I got into uh, into photography, actually, because like I said earlier, I you know I had a, a, a career in music, and I simply stepped from the stage off the stage, and I started nice. shooting. Well, my friends essentially who who were performing, you know, and that's how I got into photography in the first place, and then that for some reason took over, and then you know until until such such time that somebody said, hey, do you want to do this shoot? I actually pay you for it. And I'm like, what? You pay money? Like cash money? <laughs> like cash money? Really? <laughs> what? No way. And um, and then I realized that that's much more lucrative than being a musician. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> Every, everything's that. more lucrative well, than being a musician. That, that, sure. that. <laughs> that. So. <clears throat> um so when you first when you first decided to to become a full-time photographer like what went through your head there like cuz did you did you go from uh did you go from having a job into photography or did you go straight from university into photography or how did you how did you first ended up being a full-time photographer I I knew when I was at uni that the dream would be ultimately to do this thing full time. Mm. When I left university, I jumped within a week into working in retail, working at Jessup's, which Mm. for those of you in the UK, you might know that it's a camera based retailer that um, I worked there for about two years um, selling uh, at the time. We're going back at the time where on the shelves were the 5D Mark II, the D3, D3100s, and the 550D Canons. That's at the time yeah, yeah. to give you kind of a scope of time. So I was working there and I knew I'd love to at some point become a professional photographer. And in my head, I, I said, I'm going to slowly um, cut my hours down little by little and kind of ease into this. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the time, I was living with my parents. So I thought, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it because this is going to be a good opportunity, you know, with hardly any. Um, commitment you know no children no mortgage at the time so i thought i've got to do it now or else i won't and but but just went into administration and um two and a half thousand people lost their jobs within days and i said to myself you know when i leave jessup's it will be to to do freelancing and when i lost my job <clears throat> it was the kick up the ass i needed it really was i know it sounds awful but i'm glad that I was made redundant because it really did give me that kick up the ass. And I'm not going to lie. The first six months were awful. The first six months was such an uphill struggle trying to get work. You know, I, I put a suit on, I walked up and down my local high street. I was walking into independent coffee shops and florists and um, businesses asking the same if they want headshots, flat, uh, sh- shots of your flowers, shots of your coffee, that sort of thing. That's how I kind of got started. Um, so, the, the whole band photography thing that was just like kind of a, a hobby uh, uh, before all of that before all of that um the reason why i did band photography by the way is because i wanted to be a musician because i was like oh i wish i could play like them so that for me was the closest thing to <laughs> yeah. being a musician was photographing the musicians but but yeah so when i yeah when i when i left jessup so i just jumped head first into it really and uh it, I do wonder how I would have coped if I, you know, had a mortgage and kids. And I can totally appreciate if you are in that position, it is a, a much harder leap for sure. Um, but I'm just glad I, I did it when I did it. And, you know, after six months, it just slowly started to creep up a little bit more. I, I kind of tried to make myself known in my local area and then expand rather than just trying to jump A from A to C without going to B. I tried to stay within Kent and just grow from there, be kind of kind of known as the, that photographer, the, 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 the Kent photographer or the Chatham photographer, mm. and then grow from there. And uh, I think kind of, for lack of a better word, my, my break or kind of what progressed me was, um, again, back to music photography, I would always photograph the support acts as well as the main acts. So I photographed support acts because you never know where the support acts are going to take, are right. going to go. And I remember I took some shots of a band called Jackpack who got to the final of Britain's Got Talent and I photographed them even though they weren't the main act. But I went backstage and I walked up to the manager and said, hey, my name's Tommy. Uh, I've just taken some shots of your band. Um, you're welcome to use them. And it's it's because of photography that gave me that kind of confidence because I wasn't a very confident kid growing up, but I almost had an excuse hanging from around my neck to be able to walk up to people, especially in kind of club environments and be like, I've just taken some shots Mm. of your band. And that's how I kind of made new friends at the time. But I digress. So back to this, uh, 
um, working with this band. That band went on to become signed by Psycho, which is Simon Cowell's label. And then I ended up touring with them. Then I toured with a couple of other bands. And that's kind of how it, how it progressed from there. And uh, now I've kind of transitioned from shooting bands live to shooting bands in a portrait scenario. And then that just progressed to shooting weddings because weddings pays a little bit more naturally. And um, now I'm in a position where I'm shooting weddings, shooting portraits and teaching photographers and doing speaking events. So it's mm. kind of a little very brief overview of kind of where my journey what, went to and from. What an amazing <laughs> story, to. isn't it? Mm. It really is. You know, it, <laughs> it might sound like you've you, you've gone here to here to here to here to here to here, but I don't see it that way. I see that as a very <clears throat> organic kind of growth in the way that you've gone about things. And well, just to go back to the start a, a little there, Tommy, and this is something that um, I think anybody starting out, you know, uh, you know, making that jump from, you know, doing your day job to doing this as a profession. It's, you know, you talk there about making yourself the go-to photographer in your, in your area. And you talk about, you know, walking up and down the high street. <laughs> what were the, you know, one, two, three things that you found worked best for you in your circumstance that started to generate that business for you to generate your name um, as that go-to photographer? And because that, that's for me, that's something I find the hardest thing to you know start working through in my own head is you know, generating business. It's the hardest thing to do at the beginning, and then you you know, and then word of mouth kicks in. But what what would those couple of things be there for you that were kind of you feel looking back were key to kind of helping mm. you on your way? I was um, I was actually offering people video as well as photos at at the time, even back then, and I just thought if I can offer them as many deliverables as I can, they're more likely to say yes. And that translates to even today with brands, but even mm -hmm. back then, way back then, like a coffee shop, I would say I can, I'll be able to shoot some photos. And while I'm here, I can, you know, flick my camera into video mode and I can shoot some 15 seconds because it was 15 seconds at the time back then with Instagram, you can only upload a 15 second clip. So I think it's just been, um, being charming, charismatic, you know, I dress nice. I, I, I would mention that I'm a local boy, a local guy, and I think they kind of resonated with that. And I said, you know, I, can't, I come come all the time. I genuinely like your, um, I like the coffee, or uh, my my mum comes here all the time and buys flowers. So I think it's 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 it was it was having a personal connection. I think it's mm -hmm. I think that's it actually. It's it's the personal connection rather than just randomly walking in. Is having something that you can relate to. That, that would warrant that conversation and, and spark that kind of that relationship. So I would, um, like I said, with the coffee shop, I'd, I'd been in it before. I'd, my mum had been in the flower shop before. So there was automatically that connection. And uh, I think that's what kind of helped me is just give, injecting as much personality in there as much as you can. I think that that certainly does help. Love that. Mm. Make, makes a lot of sense doesn't it and it sure. just sounds so obvious when you say it out like that <laughs> but um it's not always immediately apparent to to everybody when you're particularly when you're starting out um as to how to go about that some people it's just obvious straight away and they just go you know they're they're those that excel but not for everyone that, that's great i love that i yeah. love that thanks alex thank you <laughs> yeah throughout throughout your career have you have you ever come across um sort of moments where you, you know, you really sort of felt, you felt like your, your confidence had taken like a complete knock. Oh, all the time, all the time, Kirsten. I don't want you to think that, you know, I'm smiling and I'm bubbly and passionate all the time because that's, uh, that's, that's not the case. I, I fall into creative ruts all the time, all the time. I did a, I did a video all about how to overcome creative block and certain mm -hmm. things that I do. And, um, um, as I get older, I'm, exercise for me is not just good for me you know um physically but I, exercise has now really helped me mentally like mm. i weirdly i get loads of great ideas when i'm listening to um like classical music when i'm out for a run so i know i mentioned music bed earlier but if i if the if the last piece of a video is a, a finding the right piece of music sometimes i will listen to the music at the very start of of a project i won't even have an idea sometimes the idea is sparked from the from the track and I, I don't know if alex you might resonate with this as a videographer but um 
obviously we don't have the luxury of having an orchestra to orchestrate a perfect piece of music based on what you've created. It has to happen the other way around. So sometimes I will just listen to music bed randomly and have it on shuffle while I'm editing and think, and some emotive piece of music just triggers an idea for me. And I've got an idea and I'm doing next week purely because I heard the track first and thought it just, I don't know, it just came to me. So that's one of the things that gives me creativity is listen, listen to emotive music quite often when I'm editing as well I won't listen to chart music I'll listen to like chill out music or piano music or strings that sort of thing that relaxes me and kind of gets me into a puts my head in a space where it allows me to be a bit more creative I think that's, that's mm. really one of the defining um sort of hallmarks of your of your videos in general is it is the music in them is quite a <clears throat> you know you do tend to pick really emotive kind of tracks to to sit underneath I don't see videos. There's definitely one thing I've noticed. I mean, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's because my, you know, histo historically, historically, I used to be a musician. I don't know if I can ever say that I used to be a musician. You still are. I'm still a musician. I still have a guitar. You're still a musician. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but obviously, I mean, music is something that I that I personally tune into really quickly. It's just, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it's just a it's a second nature. Um, and that's really one of the things I think that sets your videos apart from a lot of other tutorial videos that I that I see or that I come across is, is just the music and it fits so well. And it really sets, it sets a scene, but it also sets a frame of mind. Oh, hundred percent. When you watch that, you know, um, and, uh, and, and that's really, that's, yeah, like I said, that's one, one of the things that really attracted me to your, to your YouTube channel immediately, because it just all fit together really well. Mm -hmm. And it was also very clear that, um, that you spend a lot of time, thinking about the music and picking the music and making, you know, making the choices because, because it's not the case that the music is awesome in one video and then the next video it's, nah, you know, it's really very consistent across, um, across all, like virtually all of your videos. So, um, so that's a, that's a really, you know, it's a nice thing to see because of, well, very often that's not the case. <laughs> and, well, and that's kind of what attracted me more to music bed. If we're going to compare um, services that's what attracted me more to music bed versus say epidemic sounds i personally think music bed the production quality on their tracks are much higher i feel like epidemic sounds is great if you just need a random repeated beat to go in the background but what i love about music bed in particular is i just feel like the production quality is so much better more emotive yeah um and I, again, it could be because coming from a filmmaking background, and no doubt you'll agree with me, Alex, or well, I believe that, you know, the, the music in any film could be almost as high as 50% of, of the whole film is the oh, yeah. music. And yeah, I just, such a huge passion for music. Um, and that's why I was photographing it back in the day, because I just had that passion for music. Yeah. And uh, um, so, yeah, sometimes I, I can spend hours finding the right piece of music. I've done everything. I've just now <laughs> got to find the right piece of music. But... I know that I'm onto a winner if I find the music first and yeah, yeah, the absolutely. ideas come from that because you, the ideas and the, like the cutting, I'm already editing yep. it, it in my head because you're cutting on the beat. Mm. So with tutorials, it's obviously not, it's not going to be like that, but when it's a personal project, when you can find the music first, I get so excited about mm. doing it because it's, then it becomes so clear in my head. So clear. Doesn't it make the editing <laughs> process 10 times faster? Oh, 100% Alex, 100%, 100%. There's a, if I may, I've got a personal project next week and um, I've not told anyone this, so I'm going to tell Ooh, you guys for the first exclusive. time. Exclusive, I like it. Exclusive. Um, so one one of my playlists, I've only done one episode, but one of my playlists on my YouTube channel is a portrait of, and then it will be someone's name or it'll be a, a project that I'm working on. So the first one I did was with my friend Holly and she's been deaf all of her life. So I wanted to and again, it comes back to the importance of context, how um, it's not just enough to photograph Holly and then maybe have a caption of some nice words about her to give you context. I wanted you to hear it from the horse's mouth. I wanted to interview her to accompany the photo shoot. So with this new project in the same sort of vein, we are um, going to be photographing my friend Hazel, who was supposed to get married next next week. Um, Unfortunately, her relationship broke down and she's no longer getting married. But the dress that she bought, she, it was a 1920s themed dress. And because I'm fairly close to her, I was, you know, close to 
she, we would be in contact about how excited she was about the dress and how she can't wait for images of the dress. And as an actress as well and a, and a creative herself, she was very she was very aware and she couldn't wait for that moment. And uh, so she actually approached me and said, I would actually still love to have a photo shoot in my dress because it will give me closure. And from a mental health point of view, mm. it would, it's, it, it's something I feel like I, I want to do. It will give me, um, it will make me feel empowered. She said, being finally able to wear that dress, even like fr from an editorial point of view, like she'd quite like to, for it to look Hollywood glam editorial. And I thought, of course, I'm going to say yes, I would be privileged to. But what I didn't want it to come across is it, I just didn't want people to think that it was just another bridal shoot because I, mm. because there's so much more meaning behind what's going on here. Mm. So I said to Hazel, would you be up for being interviewed about the true nature of why we are doing this? And I've everyone around me said, she'll say no. It's way too personal. Mm. But I asked her and she said yes. Amazing. And no, awesome. I can't wait for this. It's going to be, I, I mean, I'm getting choked up just talking about it. And we've had conversations over, over video call and I know it's going to be such an emotive piece yeah. that we're going to do. And I just, I'm so privileged and we're going to be also collaborating with Leica as well. I've told them about it and we're going to be using their system to shoot it with. But if they, again, it comes back to, if they if they said no, I wouldn't care. I'm not doing it for Leica. Yeah, yeah and I, for sure. Yeah. This is this is kind of a full yeah. circle again. I know I digress a lot, but if you're if you're going with a brand with an intent of earning money out of it, but you don't actually believe in the product, if mm. if it's like a personal project, you think, yeah, I want to work with this this brand because uh, because they're good, it'll be good for me. And if they say no, they won't work with you, and you'd be like, oh well, I won't do it then. If that's your mentality, that's the complete wrong mentality. It means you've never believed in that personal project and you're just doing it because you want that recognition. Mm -hmm. Whereas with this project, it was just a last minute thing. I thought it'd be nice just to use a, a camera that isn't my 5D Mark III for a change um, yeah. because the story's still going to be there even if I shot it with or without. Yeah. But it's going to, again, I'm thinking about it from a marketing point of view they're going to be able to then distribute that because I'm using their camera. So hopefully this story will be seen by more people and it'll make that story. Yeah. Just get out there more, but I'm so excited about, mm. about this project and uh, it's going to be really emotional. I can't wait to shoot it and share this it with you guys. The, the thing about, I always find it very difficult to complete uh, emotional projects. I have to say, you know, and this is like one of the things I admire about your work really. Um, and it's just to give you like a, a little bit of a personal story. So when, um, when lockdown first hit, um, I decided, or my wife and I actually, actually, in fact, it was my wife's idea. We decided to do like a family vlog just mm -hmm. so that in 20 years time, we could look back at this really weird time and we could, um, see what happened to us as a family and how we dealt with it. And, you know, and all the trials and tribulations that we would go through, um, in, you know, during this time. And so I decided to, to start the whole thing off by interviewing my kids and my wife. Great idea. And so well, that's what I thought. <laughs> Only, and of course, you know, the, 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 the problem was that <clears throat> one of my, my youngest daughter um, is with, with us only at the weekend. So she lives with her mom throughout the week. And of course, there was a real danger at that time that I potentially wouldn't see her for quite an extended amount of time, which happened, which that actually turned out to be the case. But so this was the last weekend before this, um, uh, before, before all this happened. And, and so, you know, I set up in my little studio, I set up the whole interview set up and I, I filmed my wife and my kids and then my wife filmed me. And then when I sat down the following day to edit the whole thing, I found it impossible to get through that. And it's still, I still haven't edited it. It's just, I watched the, you know, I watched, I watched everything back and it was just like, I can't, I just can't do that. It's like, it was so overwhelming, you know, um, to not only listen to my wife and the, her fears and everything, but, you know, to listen to like my then eight year old daughter talk about all this, you know, and you could see that on one level, she didn't really understand what was happening, but on the other level, there were a lot of fears there. And mm. I sort of, you know, I looked at this form too and I thought like, now is not the right time for me to edit this. I need to have, I need to 
you know, I don't know, wait, <laughs> you know, and maybe I come back to this. Um, maybe you should send it my way to edit so you can actually just, <laughs> just, really good. just, Why did I just think of view this? the final oh, product. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I mean, it's, this is like, uh, this is this is really, really, really hard. And I, I watched some of your stuff and I thought like, wow, this is like, this is so powerful, um, you know, to watch. It's, I just, I just can't comprehend how, like, I mean, you, you must have such, um, I don't even know what the word is. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, like such compassion to, to, to like, you know, or such an ability uh, to like, to put yourself through that emotionally to, to come up, you know, to put this thing together in the end. It's just, is remarkable. You know, it really is. Thank so, you, Kirsten. And um, your idea, by the way, sounds fantastic. It sounds amazing. And I think you're right. I was going to suggest, you know, maybe it's not quite the right time with everything still kind of fresh. I mean, that, that footage isn't going anywhere, is it? That's it's always no. going to be there, ready to edit when when you feel good and ready. Or oh, get Alex to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I think it, I think it's hugely important that you've documented that. You might not think it right now, and it's not you don't feel right to edit it now. But even if you did edit it, you know, in 10 years time, 20 years time, it's not yeah. going to go anywhere. Um, no, I think exactly. it's, it's incredibly important that you've done that. And I will, you're going to thank yourself in years, years to come when you look back on it. And that's why I, that's why I do what I, what I do, like the interview with my nan. Oh, I'm yeah. so, so <laughs> glad I've done that. So yeah. glad I've done that. I said it in the video, but when I got in the car to drive home, my sister's next to me and I said, we've just filmed something amazing today. Yeah. And it is, it, it's kind of hard to be that kind of emotional with your own family because it, it's it's like uh, sometimes you don't like to show that much emotion in front of your own family. It's, yeah. But um, but it's it's I don't know with 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 my it's just something I I just kind of had to put that kind of feeling aside and just just do it just just do it because it's you're going to be so thankful years, years to come. Yeah. Like even just like, uh, I know it's, it's not kind of related, but like my partner, she's, she really doesn't like being filmed. She really doesn't like being photographed. Like when we did our, um, <laughs> my Vietnam video, which is my, my partner in that one, like yeah. she would always get annoyed, like when the camera comes out, but you know, looking back now, she always says, I'm glad we, we actually got that film now. Yeah. I'm glad that we can look back and remember, like I would have, would have forgotten that, that moment or that day, that thing that we yeah. did. You know, that's the beauty of coming full circle when I say it's not about finding your star, it's about finding the story because everyone has yeah. their own story. And you can easily start with people close to you, people at home, like your family, your yeah. children, or my 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 nan in my case. Yeah. And that is going to be a project you will look back on in five, ten years' time yeah. and be proud of it. Instead of someone posting a tutorial on can have done it again oh no <laughs> yes exactly like no that's true that, i mean it's um it's, it's funny because we, we talk about like on the podcast we talk about this um we talk about this a lot of course we talk about gear a lot because it's you know, just um it's, it's just part of it but um we also i think one of the reasons why we started the uh the podcast in the first place was actually we found that we we would talk a lot about some crazy project that some some crazy nut somewhere has come up with and of course when when uh, when everything went into lockdown it was like it was really great to see how creative people became all of a sudden yeah you know yeah. there's a dude like flying doing photo shoots with uh with families in fancy dress by, by flying his drone and taking pictures of people through their living room window on the 13th floor of a high-rise yeah. building mm. <laughs> you know and they kind of go yeah man this is, this is cool or like dave dave cox running around this neighborhood in la like light, a ninja. <laughs> yeah, like a ninja, light painting ridiculously awesome cars. <laughs> you know. There you go. But it's just it, it was just crazy to um to to see that unfold. Um and it was just really fun um to to talk about. So we, we're always trying to t to pick out these stories. Sometimes there are some some weeks that are a bit, you know, slow on the photography news side of things. Yeah. Um and other times, you know, uh, we'd come up with some there's a guy, I don't know um if you know about this, but there's there's a guy who um single-handedly caused hundreds of thousands of Android phones around the world to crash. I think you uh, told me about this on, on yeah, the phone, yeah. Gerson. Yeah, that is crazy. I mean, like, how how nuts is that? You know, <laughs> so that's it. You know, it's, it's uh, picking up funny stories like that makes it makes it all worth it. Damn right. Yeah. Damn right. Cool. I think it's, it's, easy, it's natural, though, that we that, uh, gear is a popular topic because um, 
it sells and um, it's topical. You know, it'd be nice if there was a, it'd be lovely if there was a social media devoted to just storytelling, wouldn't it? That'd oh, be sure. so cool. 100%. Yeah. How, how cool would <laughs> that be? Look, you're not allowed to post about gear. All you have to post about is your stories, your projects, you know, and with the intention of, ins- of inspiring. We're not, you're not boasting, you're not showboating, you know, it's not like I'm using the R5 for this or it's like you're yeah. using keywords. Like um, I'm, I actually did set up a domain uh, called uh, the, the memoria uh, project.co.uk memoria is Italian for memory and I just right. I thought, you know, never know I might do something there but um, but but that was my intention was yeah I'm gonna be Mark Zuckerberg and I'm gonna yeah. do a new social media <laughs> but wouldn't it be great though if I think that would encourage more inspiration more, more it would encourage more inspiration for people to do their own personal projects their own work and oh. their own creative freedom rather oh, absolutely. than just posting about what Canon have done next and this new piece of gear yeah. coming out because that's not going to spark inspiration. I mean, that's, that's, it's easy to fall into that uh, also because, uh, because uh, you know, as, as photographers generally, I mean, they, they serve a large gear because we use gear all the time. Yeah, of course. And of course, they serve a, a large component to that. But I always find, um, this is a funny thing. So my wife went to film school and, um, but she, her thing is script writing and, and storytelling. That's That's her thing. And um, of course, I watch a movie and I'm obsessed with lighting, right? Mm-hmm. And so we'd be watching the same movie and I'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe, look at that lighting. I can't believe how they lit. That backlighting is gorgeous. And she'd be like, yeah, the dialogue is shit. <laughs> 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 so it's just, it's really, um, it's, it's funny how we can have, well, we're watching the same movie, but we have completely different perspectives based on what we're paying attention to, you yeah. know? And I can like marvel, I can, I can wrap it on about how gorgeous the, you know, that, uh, how, how gorgeous the fact is that they push that blue into the shadows, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Like, well, that's, that's the beauty of film is that there's so, it's multiple different means of art within, uh, yeah. within a film that Absolutely. loads of people can gravitate towards. And that's why I just, I just love, love video. I love, mm. love films. And that's why I'd love to incorporate it in my business. And I mm. enjoy it just as much, if not more than the photography aspect. I love sharing, making behind the scenes videos. Like, yeah. Cause it, I can tell, I, I, I feel like I can tell a better story with video than I can with photography with, you know, the, the images are almost the third act and it's, mm. uh, well, how did you get there? And the, yeah. so the video, the behind the scenes video allows me to give you act one and two. Yeah, you know, the beginning, the middle, and the images at the end. Yeah, it gives you and context. It rounds it all up. And I tell you, it's a really interesting thing you just said there because um, I um, I have some affiliation with a local camera club, and uh, I don't know if you've if you've ever been a member of a camera club. But what happens a lot is is that um, you present images, and then there's a judge, and they'll they'll judge the images, and you get a certain like a mark, right? So it'll be like yes. you know, how many points, seventeen points, or eighteen points, or twenty points, whatever. And uh, <clears throat> and I'm always asked why I never put any images in for these competitions, and and, and I'm also I'm also constantly being asked uh, whether I want to become a judge or not, and and like, and I always say like, look, the, the thing for me is not the image. What I really want to know is how that image was made. I want to know mm. what the intent was behind this image, and no judge can ever tell me that. They can tell me whether the highlights are blown. <laughs> You know, yeah, but it yeah, can't, they can't, yeah. they can, they can tell me whether, you know, by some uh, technical standard, the image is good or not, but they can't tell me what the intention of, of the person was who created this image in the first place. And that's what I'm interested in, you know? Yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, I don't personally agree with art shouldn't be judged in that way. I at fully, all. absolutely agree. Yeah. Shouldn't be judged. Uh, it's art in any art, as uh, photography in any art form is subjective. It's in the Completely. eye of the beholder. Yeah. And it kind of comes back to, you know, my thought process of, you know, what about bad comments on online? It's the equivalent of someone giving me a bad mark on, on a competition. I don't, I like it. And that's all that matters. Yeah, like, yeah exactly. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean to come across like pretentious in that way, though. No, no, it's true. I feel the same thing. I was when, th- it's, when it's a personal project, then, then, then that's, that's right. If it's a client, then obviously I want to please them. But when yeah. it's my, my project, then I'm only fulfilling my own needs. But yeah. Sorry, but my, my, my way of measuring is always, you know, I like it. Great. My wife says it's not completely crap. So we're good. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <that's because>, you know. <laughs> so. there's no dialogue in your images. So that's all right. Oh, yeah. well, there's that, there's that, there's that. Um, so what's the, um, 
So what, where do you see yourself in like five, 10, 15 years time? What's, what's the next step for you? I think it's a really good question. I, I, I don't think I fully have the answer to that question yet, but what I would like to do from, from maybe the, the next kind of few years time is, is doing these portrait projects where I'm, I'm doing the hybrid of both photo and video. I think that that's where, I think that's where a lot of things are going. I think that as we all know, video just does better naturally than, than photos. And I love to do this kind of hybrid system. I, I feel like if I've, if I've got this skill, I want to use it for good. And so that's why I want to do more of these hybrid projects. I feel like it, it's, it allows me to inject more of my USP, my unique selling point, because, um, you know, you can be a great photographer, but not, um, you can, that's like the whole thing is in different pies thing. It's like, I feel, mm. I feel lucky enough that I went to university and got the skill in filmmaking. So I like that. I, I like combining, I love combining these two. So mm. yeah, for the next few years, I just want to kind of focus more in on my personal projects and, uh, just do more of these hybrid setups and combining the interview with photos rather than just behind the scenes and photos. I want to do more interviews mm. and photos combined to give you even the, I'm trying to give you the mo the highest means of context imaginable with the images. So yeah. not only showing you behind the scenes and not only showing you the final image, but giving you the interview from the actual person themselves. I think I'm, there's no more boxes I can tick to give you the context in what I'm trying to do. So I think, yeah, that's, that's what I want to progress to more. I think it's just that hybrid system. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. No, I can't <laughs> wait to see more of that. <laughs> cool. You know, and, you know, you mentioned earlier that obviously your your most two your two recent websites, you know, um, you know, your, your wedding photography and your education is bringing in the majority of your income. Are you going to, you know, you, are you trying to focus on more of those personal projects to develop more income as well and start reducing the amount of, um, you know, just for argument's sake, if, if you're doing fifty weddings a year at the minute, you know, are you going to drop that? Tr look to drop that um, and move away from weddings, or are you going to continue continue down that avenue? Uh, it's a really good question. At the moment, I I enjoy all of the aspects of of what I'm what I'm offering. I, I I like all the pies that I'm offering. So what I actually want to do, rather than focus in on one thing, if I if I can increase my income for the portrait side of things and keep the balance of the weddings, then I would I would do that because uh, I wouldn't uh, if I if if my wedding photography was growing and growing and growing, I don't want to grow too much where I don't have time for my portraits in the fear that it will hinder my creativity and that I won't feel as, in, as inspired to do the wedding side because I'm enjoying the balance of the three, of the three things that I do. Um, but back, there was, and to your other question about kind of using personal work to gain some work, some work financially, I'm luckily, I'm fortunate enough where it, I am kind, kind of doing that in, where, where I've said, where I've approached brands and I've said, yeah, um, I've got this idea for a project and it'd be great to have you on board. And then from there, we can potentially negotiate price. It's all about deliverables. And, uh, you know, I know it sounds very like kind of glamorous. Like, it's, oh, here's my idea. Do you want to be a part of it? Like what I haven't mentioned is that I will go away and I will prepare a pitch and I will make maybe six to eight page pitch about why I'm doing it what you will get from it, what your deliverables are. This is what I can guarantee. Here are my um, social media stats. Here's the potential reach. So this is, you know, this is stuff that we, I know we've left it quite late in the conversation, but mm. it's very important that these things are that I, that I do mention. So I've, I've done pictures for British Airways about going, going abroad and collaborating with them and saying that this is what you'll get out of it. Um, but if they don't go for it, then I'll either fund it myself or, um, if it is like a, that British Airways trip, then, you know, then I'll put it on the back burner for when I, when I can afford it, or maybe approach another company that I'm very much in tune with and seeing if they um, want to approach, want to jump on board with it as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so I think it's important. It's like Dragon's Den, you know, you don't go in, go in and say, oh, I want to, uh, I want a hundred thousand pounds. I go, okay, well, what's your idea? I go, well, you know, I would like to do, I might do this. And like, like I get a lot of people asking me, you know, how do you, how do you approach a brand to let you borrow stuff? And I think lots of people just want that, um, that confirmation that they're doing a good job that yes, you are good enough to borrow a lens, but 
if you want to borrow a lens, you, you, they're not just going to lend it to you for nothing. But they need to know what they're getting out of it. So again, like Drag is saying, I don't just say, can I borrow a lens? And because they're going to naturally ask, well, what do you want it for? So if you can then hit them with, I've got this project, we're going to do this, you'll get 15 images. I'm also going to give you a behind the scenes video as well. Then they're much more likely to say yes, because it comes across professional. If you've done a pitch, then that's even, even better. So yeah, I know it's a, that was a long worded answer but basically i would like to be able to still keep the balance of all three because i enjoy weddings i love teaching if it wasn't for my youtube i probably wouldn't even have a coaching website so that's one thing i am thankful mm -hmm. for it's that that's a, a natural growth as, as you said earlier alex i didn't anticipate that i would be asked to do workshops or do one-to-one -one sessions but it's because of youtube that people have reached out to me and said oh, do you mind if i have a one-to-one -one and then people come into my studio and say oh i feel like i've been here before and that's a really weird feeling you never get used to that that's, <laughs> that's yeah that's that's really that's really strange that is cool it's really cool yeah. um and it's because of that that i've been able to use it as a means of income like people say how much money do you make on youtube and it's not it's not what the platform itself is making me is, yeah. is giving me it's how i'm using that platform to reach with brands or offer online coaching sessions if that makes sense yeah mm. yeah wow that i know you said you thought that was kind of a long-worded answer <laughs> that wasn't to me at all that was <laughs> okay, there was cool. a wealth of gold information in there mm. and no, if anybody that, takes anything away from today's episode probably that answer right there contained so much great info mm. listen to it <laughs> thanks so much man appreciate it thank you Right, Tommy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Genuinely enjoyed this conversation. It's been great meeting you both. I love this I love this kind of dynamic, this setup of seeing you both and being in the same room. I've, I've really enjoyed this chat. As I think, you know, we, we, we can consider ourselves as having made it when somebody comes here and says, like, I feel like I've been in this place before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well... When I when I come and visit you guys, I I will say exactly that. But like, oh, that, that's the mirror. That's the that's plant. The mirror. That's, yeah, that's the mirror. Ground. That's the one that fell over in episode. <laughs> I, know, I know you've been I know you've been to New York before because I've seen your video. Um, but I had uh, the last time I went to uh, sorry the first time I went to New York I had had exactly that um, that experience. Like I was I was uh, I was riding in a in a cab, and I'm looking I'm looking out and I'm thinking, all oh, of this looks so familiar, like this yeah. corner store. It feels like I've been, and then we're like, "Oh, it's in that movie." Okay, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, where he went and got lost in New York. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> like yeah. every fire escape, right? It's just like looks right. like the uh, looks like a transition exterior in Friends. Like it's yeah, uh, yeah. Like when you yeah. see when you see the police cars, it's like in every single movie. It yeah, just absolutely. feels like a, you're on the back lot of Universal Studios. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's hilarious. Love that. So yeah. <laughs> Most excellent to have you on here. It's a complete thrill. Um, I won't lie. Um, again, thank you so much. And that's really it for us today. Yeah. And that was that most excellent? That was a bit Bill and Ted. Oh, uh, so was it? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I haven't even seen a new movie yet. No. What can no, I say? No. What can I say? So uh, remember, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, then uh, make sure to leave us a comment um, because it really helps us to be found in the you know, infernal sea of podcasts out there. And likewise, if the sound of our silky smooth voices is enough for you, then you can always head over to YouTube where you can um, enjoy or endure the full video version of this podcast. <laughs> As always, just uh, search for uh, search for Camera Shake Podcast on YouTube. What a little side comment there. We are working hard to hit the 100 subscriber limit. Not limit. What's it called? It's not a limit. Target? Target. Because that will allow us to uh, actually custom name our podcast. So we want to make this happen. So, you know, give us a hand in doing that. That'd be wicked awesome. Yeah. Um, for now, it is goodbye from us. And we shall be back next Thursday. And that's not a threat. Yeah.